Jesus. Listen, we're going to be, we're going to be preaching out of, um, out of second, uh, first Corinthians 2 this morning. Uh, I do, really, before we start reading, I just want to kind of maybe give you like some kind of immediate context, you know. Uh, a lot of Paul's writings, if you don't know this, are what you call epistles. Uh, E-P-I-S-T-L-E-S. Fancy word. It's just another way to say letter. Okay? The Apostle Paul wrote many letters. Peter wrote some letters to the church. John also, 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John wrote letters to the church. Jude, his book is a letter to the church. So whenever we read, you know, one thing about, listen, what I want you to understand, I'm not trying to get too technical on you this morning, but I do want you to understand that there's different kinds of literature in the Bible. And that various literature, it, there's a different way that you perceive it. What, what are you trying to say, preacher? What I'm trying to say is, is that sometimes in the Old Testament when there's a story, we have to look deeply within the movings of the characters and the things that are happening in their lives. And when we do that with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can begin to take out of those stories and the lives of the characters and the occurrences that take place, biblical truth that we find in the New Testament, that's just the beautiful authorship of the Lord that we serve. And he's a master writer. And he was, and, and he's able to reveal through the Old Testament, New Testament truths. Sometimes when we're, when we're studying the book of Revelation or even the book of Daniel, it's very apocalyptic. It's very symbolic in nature. So we have to try to take from the symbology and other aspects of the word of God to bring forth or to pull out the truth that God is trying to show us. But listen, when it comes to the letters, pretty much straightforward. Now, sometimes we don't understand exactly what they're saying because, you know, there's a gap. I used to say this a lot when I went to, I'm, I'm grateful I went to Bible college. I learned a lot of stuff there that, I, that well, I learned a lot of stuff on not what to do, but I also learned some important things, okay? And one of the things that I learned was some of this concept called the, this is fancy word, ter terminology here, the principalizing bridge. <laughs> what does that mean? It means that when the when the Lord first spoke through the first voice, through the prophet to the first audience, there was a specific meaning that he was saying to that audience. Does that make sense? What, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say when God spoke through Isaiah to rebellious Israel, warning them that if they did not change, that there was going to be trouble up ahead. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, guess what? We're far removed from Israel. We're 2,000, we're, we're 3,500 years removed from that occurrence. But can I tell you that there's a principle uh, uh, that's still alive in the Word of God today? The prophet of the Lord would still speak and say, if you don't turn from the way that you're going, there's trouble up ahead. That, that principle, we got to cross that bridge, my friend. we got to be able to take from what was originally spoken. And I mean, you can't just go to the Word of the Lord and create some new meaning that was never there. You also don't want to put God in a box because it's His Word. And sometimes there's things in the Word of God that we have never seen before. And the Word of God is alive. Amen. I want you to know that. The Word of God is, the Bible says that of itself in Hebrews 4 and 12. That the Word of God is quick. That means alive. That's old King James language for alive. It is alive. It is powerful. It is sharper than the two-edged sword. It will begin to divide the sun like a surgical knife between bone and marrow. And soul and spirit. There's only one thing that separates the soul and spirit of man is the word of God. Yes. He'll show you the motives and the intents of your heart, wow. child of God. Yes. Listen, sometimes whenever the Lord starts showing you your heart, starts oh. showing the preacher his heart. Oh. There's an oh Lord, forgive me, right? Yes. But thank God that he cares. Thank God he loves. So the main point I wanted to get across is, is that when we're reading the letters of the Apostle Paul or these epistles, the theology or the, the doctrine, what is the, the fancy word doctrine? Instruction. The instruction of God. Now, listen, whenever you were growing up and your parents would try to say things to you, my dad, I don't know why, how I ended up like this because my dad was a one-liner. You hear me? He always, every, the way he communicated was, just, I don't even want to sit here and think of some of his one-liners because I'll go off on a tangent. But the point is, is that what he said was fast to the point and, and simple, okay? And yet half the time, I wasn't even listening to what he said. You understand what I'm getting at? And, and, and I just want to make sure that we don't get, let me just tell you a funny story real quick before we get into the word. One time, 
I was walking, I was at Bayou Pediatrics, and I was so slammed. I'm telling you, like, I, it just seemed like the patients were never going to stop. It's a long story on why it is that way. They would overbook the patients because it's like an airline. You don't know who's going to show up, all right? So they all showed up today. It was raining outside. They didn't want to stay in their house. I don't know why they came, but they all came and drove. And as soon as I get rid of one wave, here came another wave. And I was just like, and, I, and it was Bible study night. And I was like, Lord. And I now started realizing, what are you lying, devil? You're just trying to mess me up. And then all of a sudden, I'm walking down the hall, and I remember one of my dad's old sayings. I hope it's okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tone it down for you. And I just busted out laughing in the middle of the hallway. I just remember him saying, I called him up, hey, man, what you, how you been doing? He said, I'm busier than a one-legged man and a butt kick. <laughs> but you know what happened was, was I got a visual of a one-legged man trying to win a butt-kicking contest. And that was pretty hilarious because that's exactly how I felt. But all them times he had said that to me as a kid, I never said, oh, what are you talking about, man? A one-legged man and a butt-kicking guy. That don't even make no sense. What I'm trying to say is, is this, is that in these New Testament letters, the instruction is right here on the page. And we just need the Lord to help us Amen. to see it. Amen? All right, let's read it. <laughs> and I, brethren, this is the Apostle Paul speaking to the Corinthian church. And again, this is where I really meant to go. Corinth was worse than New Orleans. Yes. Corinth had two harbors and the sailors would come in to bring uh, all of the goods into the port. And there was literally a temple to false gods in the city of Corinth. And the way that these people worshipped their false gods was with something called temple prostitutes. It is exactly what you think. They would pay money and have sex in the house of the God, and that's how they worship God. Now, you talk about hard, maybe, to fill up a church whenever the other people are peddling that for how you worship God. That's just what it was. And those gods are still alive today, my friend, and they're vying for the attention of God's people. Yet, the Apostle Paul was not going to be hindered by that because he knew that even though they thought they were having fun up in the house, really they were becoming slaves to those various gods that they were serving, right? And so the Apostle Paul was going to say, and he writes, he, he establishes these churches. He said, I didn't come with you to you with words of wisdom and lofty words and superior, superior speech. I came to you with a demonstration and the power of God. Amen. Now, I don't want you to get lost in the midst of all of that. Because, listen, the modern church is always looking for a sign and a wonder. And Jesus said this, a wicked and adulterous generation Seek after a sign and a wonder. Listen, we got to find the balance of what God is really trying to tell us here. You hear me? I've had people say to me before, but what about the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit? And it was a person that was very, very close to me. And I said, the problem is, is that we see a lot of moving and operation of some spirits, but I'm not so certain it's the Holy Spirit. Come on, brother. Just be, we, we think we ain't had church in that unless everybody doesn't fall out of the altar. And I can tell you right now that every time somebody falls, it ain't the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you right now, the heart of man and in his flesh will begin to allow some of this to happen. And we get all excited. I'm not trying to say that the Lord can't knock you down. Come on, man. Right. Amen. But I will tell you this. See, I'm going back to the Word, my friend. The word is the rule of authority. And what I started to do is I started thinking about that because you know how and why I know that? Because my mom, more than once, I thought that's what I was supposed to do. The preacher put a little bit of pressure on my head and I thought that was my cue. I hate to tell you, but I was bound up in the cycle of what was going on. I'm being transparent with you. I'm not trying to tell you, listen, if the Lord wants to knock people down, I want the Lord to knock people down. But I don't want nothing to fake. I don't want nothing to fake, my friend. And, and I can remember like opening my eyes as it's time for me to get out. And later after the Lord started to deliver me, he reminded me of all of these things. And he's like, what is this? And I, so now you, you, you need to search the scriptures. How many times do people fall down in the word? I look in the New Testament. Guess how many times people fell down in the word? In the New Testament. Guess how many times that I can see. I'm not trying to see nobody else fell down. I mean, the Apostle Paul no. fell down on the road to Damascus. But what was the Lord doing? Striking him down. You're, you're kicking against the bricks, Paul. You're going in the wrong direction. And then, and then there's another time in the Garden of Gethsemane when a whole group of people fell down. Remember that? Hey, Jesus, he feels them behind him. He says, who do you see? We see Jesus of Nazareth. I am. Boom, they all fall down. There's another thing. Like, are you going to fall down into those situations? I'm not going to fall down. Because, see, that's the word rebuke. 
rebuking people. Right? One time I can find in the Old Testament where a group of people fall down and it was actually under a godly situation. Mm. When they dedicated the temple of Simple, <laughs> not the temple of Simple, the temple <laughs> of Solomon. When they dedicated the temple of Solomon, the glory right. cloud descended into the house of the Lord. And it says that the priest could not minister because mm. of the presence of the Lord. And I can just imagine that. I mean, I don't know what it looked like. They might have been falling yeah. out like flies for all I know. But I can just imagine them slowly like falling Hallelujah. to their knees and glory to the Lord. Amen. I want something. Yes. <laughs> yes. Lord, please, amen, descend in the house of God. I got to be honest with you. I want to be careful. That I don't get so caught up that I that I'm trying to put God in a box. I don't want that. I want God to move through His power and His anointing. Amen. So, but I want you to know that that there's a whole lot of crazy stuff going on in Corinth. And listen, let me just say this: there's a whole lot of stuff that's happening. Some of it's real. I'm talking about the gifts of the Spirit. You want to learn about the gifts of the Spirit? You need to see what the Apostle Paul says to the church in Corinth. You know what he tells them? He says. He, he, basically, he says, you're like a bunch of babies. You're like a bunch of babies, and you, you move and you operate in all of these gifts, but basically, you ain't got no fruit. Y'all are carnal. Mm -hmm. Like, y'all over here divided over you. you. Oh, I'm of Peter. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. They're over here like, this is my favorite preacher. That's my favorite preacher. That's carnality. If somebody's preaching the truth, we need to get past on. Paul said, did I die for you? No, I didn't die for you. Jesus died for you. Amen. Amen. And I understand that we all have certain uh, preachers that we like better than others, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's certain things. But, but listen, what, you, what we need to really learn is to be able to hear the truth and to know when we're hearing the truth. Amen. And, and, and you know, some people may not, well, I love Pastor Matt, but I don't like the way this guy brings it, man. He, he got a little oomph, man. He kind of remind me of whatever. Okay, that's fine. As long as what his oomph is sound saying is, is the word of the Lord. Amen. There's nothing wrong with that. All right. So there's a mess in Corinth. I want you to know and there's a mess in the modern church. We're going to try to principalize truth out of this story today and make it our own this morning. Amen? He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. You know, they say the Apostle Paul had a lot of physical ailments, eye problems. He was a, a man of short stature. Uh, there was a lot of things that he, there wasn't like a whole lot. He wasn't, it doesn't seem like he was real nice looking. He wasn't a real big guy. People would not have really been attracted to him physically per se. But boy, when he spoke and listened to the power and the unwillingness to quit in this in this man is just unbelievable you like if you study him you won't see another brother that that lived for the lord and did the work of god like he did all right but so i was with you in much trembling and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom and now i want you to pay attention to this because one thing i do want to say is this what is you you have to imagine in your mind what the demonstration and power of god is for you i'm not here to try to tell you what what my, yeah, I have my own opinions, and I've already shared some of them. I'm not trying to skew people's way of thinking, okay? I just, I'm just trying to get to the bottom of the truth just like you are. And what I'm trying to say is, is that if people just falling out and jerking and shaking on the ground, the manifestation of God's power, it, it, maybe it could be, but, if it, but and, and, and I'm not trying to take that away. But guess what? One thing that was happening is the power of God was changing people's hearts. Is that not a powerful thing if you all of your life were a lying, thieving, cheating, stealing, drunkard, doing drugs, and the, and the power of the gospel comes into your heart and life and sets you free and you become a new man or woman in Christ and the power of God has been demonstrated in your life? Ain't nobody going to be able to take that away from you, my friend. That wasn't some counseling session with a psychologist on a couch. That was the Lord of glory that came in and did a work on the inside of your heart. And if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. Right. Amen. Demonstration of the spirit and the power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now look at this though. See, just as soon as you were like, yeah, but I want to see the power preacher. Look what he said right here. How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Right. Look. 
If you want to see perfect, if we looked at other translations, you know what it would say? Among them that are mature. So, I didn't come with you with enticing words of wisdom, but instead in the demonstration and power of the Lord. However, what we do is we speak wisdom to those that are mature. Mm. See, so don't read what you want to read. Get the whole thing from the sermon. Amen? From them that are mature, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom. Which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knows no man but the Spirit of God. You know, I didn't put this in my main message, but I think that this is an important concept for us to try to, like, just kind of settle down just for a second. What he's basically saying is you can think you know somebody, Right? Like, I mean, I feel like I know Sabrina pretty good. I know some other people in the church good. I definitely know my wife well. But even sometimes, and my wife would probably tell you that's because that's your fault, Matt, because you don't act right, okay? And she might be right. But what I'm trying to say is, as well as she knows me, sometimes she gets me wrong. She, and maybe it's because I'm sending the wrong message through nonverbal communication, but it's not really what's in my head and in my heart at the time. Does that make sense? It doesn't matter how close you think you know somebody. Ain't nobody really knows what's going on in the, in the inside of that person except the spirit of that person. Amen. Somebody might be acting all tough and, and whatever, whatever, but you don't really know what's deep down in there is what I'm trying to say. And the, and the clue that he's trying to say is this. Look, you don't really know what's in the heart of a man. The spirit of that man knows because he knows what's going on on the inside of him. Same thing with God. No man really knows the heart of God except the Spirit of God. Before I get moving too fast, though, let me just say that's good news for you, my friend, because if you're born again this morning, the very Spirit of God lives on the inside of you. All right? Let's just keep reading. No man knows the things of God but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak. Not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness of him. Let me just say that. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness of him. I just want to make a, a quick point on this in case I forget to say it later. That, uh, you know, the natural mind and the natural man, what the Bible's really talking about, the word in the Greek is psychikos. It's also another word that, where we get our word psyche from. But what it's really talking about is it's talking about the man outside of God. It's talking about the unredeemed. It's talking about someone that's not saved or born again. Okay? But can I tell you that sometimes believers can still operate in their natural mind? Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Now, I want you to know this morning that God wants to give you a new mind. He wants to give you a new way of thinking. Amen. He wants his spirit that's on the inside of you to begin to transform your way of thinking and the way you view this world that we live in. Amen. But I need you to know that there is a danger because the whole world, I'm preaching already, I need to, I need to slow down, but, but the whole world is trying to influence your thinking and the way that you see things and the way that you behave in this journey called your life, right? But the natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Look, I don't even... I wasn't even going to pay a whole lot of attention to that verse, but I just want to tell you something this morning. If you're going through something in life, whether it's next week or two years from now, and you find yourself where people are looking down on you, okay, mm -hmm. because you did something, you made a boo-boo, mm -hmm. 
And boy, they was waiting for you to make a boo boo. Were they not? Come on, somebody. I've seen it in my life. Oh, and you call yourself a Christian. And look what you did. And look what you said. Look, look, buddy. The enemy is out there ready to call you guilty. What the word of the Lord is saying is he's not trying to say that, that you ain't never going to be judged for any kind of mistakes that you made. But listen, the judgment is up to the Lord. That's right. the, no, man, you don't need to be judged by no man. Oh, we judge people's fruit. I can tell you, oh, well, that wasn't the Lord. And sometimes when I say something, hey, that wasn't the Lord. That was my flesh, right? But and guess what? The Lord wants to judge those that belong to him, and he will. And if you will walk with him, he will, uh, he will judge the things that you do, and he will correct you in the journey of your life. But if you start seeing people coming down on you to the point where, the, and listen, at the same time, in this same letter, I was listening, I've been listening to the, to the Bible every day, and it's been written, I've been really enjoying it. But there is a passage of scripture where it says, in 2 Corinthians, it says this, and, I, and sometimes you forget it, but it says this. It says, if the, the brother that's caught in the immorality, y'all remember that letter? It doesn't mean you that have read the Bible, y'all know what I'm talking about. He said, there is an immorality reported amongst you that is not even heard of in the world. That's saying a lot in this city, my friend. He said, he said, a man has his father's wife, and he's bold about it. So this dude's sleeping with his daddy's wife. And he's like bragging about it, dude. Like, yeah, man, look what this is what I'm doing. You see how pretty my daddy like is? Yeah, man. He's talking trash about it. And the apostle Paul says, what are you doing? He's not repenting. He's continuing to live the way he's choosing to live. Guess what? I'm going to try to remember that one from now on. Because if there's people in the Listen, it's one thing if you got things in your life that you're not happy about. Right? And that we're dealing with. Right. right? And we're asking God to do a work. That's something different, my friend. I'm talking about... And listen, sometimes you'll know when somebody say, Oh, yeah, well, I'm still love, I still love the Lord. I'm still doing this. No, you, no, 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 no. You're talking trash now, my friend. You continue to live the way you live. You know what the word says? Cast him out. Turn him over to the devil so that his soul might be saved. Right, right. And, and then, you know, he goes on to say in the next chapter, he tells the people in the church, quit fellowshipping with that brother. Mm -hmm. And he calls him a brother. And then, and then the apostle Paul goes on to say this, you think that I'm trying to tell you to stay away from the world? No. Now, listen, he ain't trying to tell you to go belly up to the bar with the world. Jesus ain't never bellied up to the bar and did what they did. Jesus lived a separated life. Paul lived a separated life. But what he's saying is, I'm not trying to teach you some doctrine of isolation. I'm trying to tell you that if you've got brothers in your midst that are saying one thing and living something else, and or living obviously outside the will of God, you ought to not be going to sit at the table and eat with them and fellowship with them. It's danger, my friend. So, you know, you need to know about the Lord. Don't get judgmentally either, Christian, please. Uh -oh. Don't have to. I got that. You preach for an hour and 50 minutes. Yeah, because I got to make sure that everybody doesn't put words in my mouth. Oh, well, you know, he he's not living for God. So the pastor said for me not to fellowship. No, come on, man. You need to be led by the Holy Spirit. Come on, you remember how much you struggle with God? Come on, pastor. You remember how many things you went through? Don't be judging your brother and your sister. Amen. Amen. Because guess what? The Word of God says in Galatians, it says that if you find a brother in the fault, you should restore such a woman gentleness and meekness, lest ye yourself also be tempted. What that means is, if you go ahead and get prideful, my friend, because you know what's going to happen? The Lord will remove his hand a little bit, and he's going to let some of that stuff jump on you. That same stuff that's on your brother that you caught. But you're like, hey, did you hear what those so and so has been doing? Oh man, I saw him. I'm just some of y'all might think I'm talking about y'all. I'm not. I saw him at the gas station. You should have seen what he looked like and what he was talking about. Oh Lord, he was a mess. Yeah, well, guess what? You better be careful, friend. Yeah. Better watch that gossip in tongues. Better watch it. Because you know what? The Lord will let something jump on you. Anyway, this is all about part of the message. But That's true. He himself is judged of no man for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him. But we have. The mind of Christ. All right, let's get into this to this word a little bit here. You know, <clears throat> I want you to see that I put right here. This is the title to my message. His mind is a terrible thing to waste. I got that from, you know, some of you might have grown up in the 80s like I did. I'm pretty sure that it was a, they, they'd say, here's your brain. I think, right? They have a frying pan. 
Uh, well, no, like, here's your brain. They had two eggs on the, on the tape, on the counter. And they had a frying pan on stuff. Here's your brain, the two eggs. Here's your brain on drugs. And they put some eggs in the frying pan. You know, and then they would say this, our mind is a terrible thing to look at. I want you to know that, you know, some of our minds, the way they used to be, wouldn't be that terrible to waste them and to throw them away. Put them in a way back. But his mind is a terrible thing to waste. Now, three main things that jumped out to me in this passage of Scripture was testimony, wisdom, and Mind. And those are the three things that I want to talk to you about this morning real quick as we move forward. But you're going to, we're going to start with testimony. I want to mention to you a little bit. You know, I said something about testimony earlier. But testimony is such a powerful thing. Amen? Some of these things say, everyone has a story. The power of testimony. Share your testimony. Listen, I know I've shared this story before, but when I was on Bourbon Street that time ministering the gospel, and you remember I had that checkbook Bible, and that dude from France, he had just graduated as a mechanical engineer. He's like, why are you here? And I pulled the Bible. I thought I don't want to see that. I, I, because he didn't believe in it, but he had to know. Why are you here? And then finally the Lord said, tell him your story, man. And I, and I just said, Jesus changed me. Mm. Now, I don't know about you, but I love people's testimony. I'm telling you right now, and, and listen, this is this is weird stuff. This is just who, I, who the Lord redeemed me. I'll be, every now and then you'll get a glimpse of who I used to be. How in the world are you 15 years old, you steal your dad's car, you run away to California, you end up in a bus station in El Paso, Texas, and out of all the people that you don't know, you meet up with another person that's doing drugs. How'd that happen? Because there's a spirit leading you. I'm telling you right now, there's a spirit leading you. Trying to get you to find that stuff. A kindred spirit. Oh, I can see it. There he is. Way over there. He got the stuff, my friend. Because see, the devil's all about trying to destroy you. Right. But guess what? The Holy Spirit will do the same thing. In your path or your journey of life, next thing you know, you can be a pediatrics. It's going to get you some coffee. And there's the community coffee, man. And how it happened, I don't know. But next thing you know, two minutes in, we both understand we believe it. You know what I'm saying? It's like the Holy Spirit is going to try to lead you and guide you. And one of the things that has happened to me through the years is I'm like, dude, tell me your story. Like, I don't even know this guy from Adam. I don't know what kind of doctor he's in. But I'm just, how have you got saved, man? I want to know. I want you to give glory to God when I didn't say all that. I'm just saying. I want to hear the glory of God. How did you get saved, sir? I know my story. My sister, you know the story. You probably get tired of it. Don't get tired of people's testimony. There's power in your testimony, my Amen. friend. Amen. Listen, sometimes the people that you're talking to and you're sharing your testimony with, I can assure you the people over there at the hospital, the people in some of these clinics, because I can listen, they're like, well, look what you did for you. No, you don't understand, dude. I didn't do nothing for myself. I know we all want to give props to, oh, you cleaned yourself up, all that stuff. No, you don't understand. I was sitting on an air conditioner outside a convenience store waiting for somebody to come get me high. I didn't even know how to get my own stuff, okay? That's how bad off I was, my friend. I was a bum of bums. And the Lord saw me dressed in rags mm. and reached down and Amen. he said, I got something better for you, son. I'm trying to tell you that the Lord yes. will change it. Yes. And your home. Don't try to take the glory away from my Jesus. You might think I'm a fool by the time I'm telling you this story. But I believe that when we walk away, you might have thought I was foolish. But the Holy Spirit is going to yes. deal with you. And he's going to yes. contend with you because he loves you and he wants your soul. Yes. Don't be scared to share your story, my friend. All right? Ask the Lord to anoint you. Yes. Ask the Lord to touch you. Yes. But listen, we ain't even really talking about our story this morning. I'm talking about, we're talking about the story of the Lord. Look at that. See, I've been reading the Bible for so long. Paul says, and when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. Amen. As long as I've been reading the Bible, I got to tell you, I don't know that I ever caught on to that. The testimony of God. God has a testimony. It's the very word in the Greek. It's martyrion. It's where we get the word martyr from, which translated later on in life because people that were given testimony and witness for Jesus ended up losing their lives for the cause. And that's where the word martyr comes from. But the real meaning is testimony. Somebody that gives witness to the facts. <laughs> you ever see? You ever been in court? I hope you had, but I have. Look, they calling people up there. Give testimony to the facts, sir. Right? Giving their witness. Listen, God has a testimony. 
Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. I bet you already know what it is, but I'm about to share it with you. Look at the next verse. Let's find out what God's testimony is. Here you go, right here. Boom. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That is the testimony of God. Now, listen, I want to I want to take a second. I want to do a little bit of teaching. Bear with me. Recently, someone told me that there's factions in the message of the cross folk. And it didn't surprise me. I'm like, I ain't caught up in all that. I ain't even think. But the factions are saying, they're not even preaching the cross anymore. Dude, this is the same old lame, tired story. I shared that with Robert way back when I didn't really even know nothing about the, the Bible per se. I was just learning the Lord and just opened my eyes. But what I knew, I knew. And I was like, well, you know, this old boy that's coming to the Bible study, he's a little concerned because you, you ain't saying the word cross enough. <laughs> I'm like, dude, are you even serious? That's the same thing people are saying today about that, about that ministry. Oh, they're not saying the word. We want to hear the word cross more. We want to hear the word blood more. But let me tell you something. I told Robert, how many years ago was that? I don't know. 10 years, 12 years, 15 years ago. I said, Robert, let me tell you something, my brother. I can preach a message of the message of the cross, the message of the finished work of Christ, the new covenant message for an hour and a half, and never mention the word cross or blood one time. You need to understand it ain't about a word, it's about the truth, it's about the testimony of God that man was fallen, born the first time in Adam, and that he was separate from God, and that his mind was all twisted off away from God. But hallelujah, he had a plan. Listen to me, my friend. The message of the cross is in the fact that there was, that there was no people called, uh, called by God, but he called a man named Abraham out from amongst the heathen, out from amongst nobody that knew God. And through him, he created a nation. And through that nation, thousands of years later, he gives us Jesus. Yes. And Jesus dies on the cross. His sinless life offered a sacrifice to pay the penalty of the eternity of, of Adam's fallen race. And that when that message goes forward, the message of what? The message of the fact that you were born a sinner the first time, but I got good news. His name is Jesus. And he was the prescription from the Father to die for your sin. Hallelujah. That's the message because that's the word, because that's the testimony, because that's the truth. And God, listen, that's just the beginning stage. Well, I, I've got to show you now. i got to move on. You ain't moving on, my friend. If you try to move away, you ain't never going. You keep moving away, you won't move. You, ain't, you may not come back. You better not leave the foot of the cross. Because see, that's another element to the message of the cross if we're going to go ahead and be Saying, the same way you received him, so shall you continue to walk in. How did you receive him? Through faith. You got a whole lot of stuff in you, Christian, just like I got a whole lot of stuff in me that needs to be crucified. Amen. What you talking about, preacher? I ain't got, yeah, you do. Because I'm, I'm telling you, yeah, I do. <laughs> I got a bad attitude sometimes. I talk about stuff all and I talk about sometimes. You do too. Sometimes the, our actions don't bring reflection of the goodness of God. Lord, we got to come to the place in our walk and understanding like, God, I don't need to hear the word cross. I just need it. Lord, take that away. When I say, Lord, take that away, that's what I'm thinking. You may not be there yet. I mean, not that, not that I provide. I'm saying you may not be at that place yet where you understand when you say, Lord, take it away. What you're really saying is, Lord, crucify that thing in my life. That's part of my old man. Yeah. He was nailed on the cross with Jesus at Calvary. He was buried with Jesus in the tomb. Now there's a new man resurrected to newness of life. It's the testimony of God that is the message of the cross. Now how many times I use a word? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. I want you to see that. Paul said, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I need you to get a hold of that. I don't think, you, I don't think that... Maybe somebody on video needs to understand. I, know, I need us to get a hold of that. Yeah. This is the plan of God. Mm. But, but can I, listen, that's part of the reason why I want us to, to buy that little book and do that little class. Because I want you to see, listen, the message of the cross is a huge part of the overall plan of God. Let me explain to you why. 
Because really, you ever heard of the kingdom of God? Do you understand that there's been great rebellions against God? Do you understand that there's angelic rebellions and the crazy things they did during before the flood and the Nephilim and demon spirits that have come through that and the principalities and powers that try to lock people up and mess people up and are pulling them away from God, but yet God says that he has a kingdom and that he's restoring his kingdom and he's producing a people. But guess what? If you bound up in your own sin and you don't understand the finished work of Christ, you can't be free in order to do what God has called you to do, which is to That's seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. And what we have now is a seeker-sensitive environment in the church where everybody's focused on self. They, we got to present the, the Bible in such a way that people are comfortable. Or before that, we had the word of faith, which was the prosperity-driven message where it was a greed gospel. Well, I want to get what I got coming from the Lord. It's, it's all about me now. No, it's not. It's about the Lord. Amen. Then he wants to do a work in you. And guess what? If you'll trust him and walk with him, you know what he'll do? He'll do a work again. He'll also bless you. Right. As soon as he thinks he can trust you with this, he'll give it to you. Amen. As soon as he thinks he can trust you with that, he'll give it to you. All right. I determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I want you to see here in 1 Corinthians 2, 6. I'm going to read it. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this work, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. Now listen, I just want to, I told you I was going to talk to you a little bit about wisdom also. And I want you to understand that there's a wisdom of the world. I speak to people all of the time, and they got stuff that they, they just got stuff figured out. Is it, I think it's still okay to, to we, we still have freedom of speech in this country. Yeah. I think we do. We still got a first amendment. Okay. Well, we're just going to go ahead and Utilize our freedoms. Amen. And we'll just believe God that as we utilize our freedom of speech, the world won't be able to harm us or do anything to us that God will That's right. That's right. Human wisdom has begun to tell us that it's perfectly normal for a person that had a proclivity or a desire to lie with a person of their same gender and now it's telling us that one of those people of that same gender can now begin to identify as the opposite gender to the point where they can now take hormones and change their physical structure even to the point where they may even get an operation that will change their anatomy. Oh, listen, church, don't get all holy on me. This is the world we're living in. Change their anatomy. Okay, hold on a second. Now to the point where originally the relationship started off where a person had a proclivity or a desire to go towards someone that was of the same gender. But now the person that they fell in love with has created an alternate gender for themselves. And so now they're right back at square one. <laughs> and that's human wisdom. Right, right. And they say that I'm foolish. Yeah. Now, I'm not trying to, listen, I understand because I'm around people. I'm not trying to beat nobody up. I'm not trying to make fun of nobody. I'm just trying to say, well, why am I not saying? Why would I'm saying that God loved you enough to send his son Jesus to die for your sin? Why, why, why does that sound so foolish? The apostle Paul said, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, that is not of this age, not of the rulers of this age who are passing away. Listen, the leadership that's in the government and the leadership that is behind all of this stuff, they're passing away. God says, listen, they're, they're just a little vapor of light too. But they change in time. That's the spirit of Antichrist that is behind all of these times and epics that are being changed. Daniel warns about that. Right. He says in verse 7, But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestinated before the ages 
to our glory. Dude, that is so beautiful. I know it's a lot of big words, but listen to me. Predestinated, that means that God had this plan in his heart and in his mind from the very beginning. The first Peter chapter one says this, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your former way of life, but instead through the precious blood of the lamb, which was foreordained before the very foundation of the earth. Before God ever reached down there and molded Adam out of clay and breathed his life into Adam's lifeless body. Before that, God already knew the serpent was going to convince even Adam to go his way. That it was going to cause the fall, but yet he had a plan. Well, why would he do such a thing? Listen, I, I, forgive me for, for over explaining. Do, do you want, you know, a robot's fine if, that's, if he's just going to vacuum your car for you. <laughs> A robot's fine is going to bring you a glass of milk when you need it or get something out the fridge for you. Yeah. Uh, you know, but, but, but is that going to work if, if you want to love somebody? You know, the true, I think that part of the true meaning of love, and especially definitely with the Lord, is reciprocation. God loves us, and guess what? He wants us to love Him. And a human being can't love something if it don't understand what it's doing. And in order to be able to understand what it's doing, it's got to have a free will. And in order to be able to exercise the free will, there's got to be more than God. Okay? I, I mean, if, if anything past that is above my pay grade. But the point that I'm trying to make is, is that don't question God. Because you know what he said in Jeremiah? He said, does the potter question, I'm sorry, does the clay question the potter? No. The clay doesn't question the potter. Just trust the Lord. Amen? Yeah. So, praise God. It's God's wisdom. It's a mystery. It's been a hidden wisdom. You can't just see it with your physical eyes. The mystery of God, God's wisdom, shows up when you hear the truth, when you accept the truth, and when you start feeding yourself the truth, God's wisdom starts to permeate. It starts to become alive. Listen, can I just share with you real quick? I, I'm trying to hustle, but I, I wanted to show you a scripture that the Lord reminded me of. You know, for the longest time, I was really just struggling as a, as a believer. I was struggling so bad. And if you could have heard my little prayers, you, you, you'd been like, man, that guy seems like he really loves the Lord. I'd be like, Lord, please forgive me. Forgive me for my lustful heart. Forgive me for my wicked heart. Lord, please, please make, make me right, Lord. And then whenever my sister died and the Lord showed up and I started to become hungry for the Word of God, I remember I was sitting in Cornerstone's youth hall. Okay, it's a long story, but I was sitting in Cornerstone's youth hall, and I had my little my little checkbook Bible, and I pulled it out, and it was a proverb of the day, and I leaned up against the wall, and I read this. He said, "When wisdom enters into your heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto your soul, discretion will preserve you. Understand." I said, "Lord, that happened. That happened. Wisdom entered into my heart." Knowledge became pleasant to my soul before I was just going through the motions. I'll be here to tell you this morning, church. You might want to cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, let your wisdom enter my heart. And he is. His name's Jesus, my friend. Let your wisdom enter my heart. Let your knowledge become pleasant to my soul. We're talking about wisdom, my friend. And we're not talking about the wisdom of the world. We're talking about the wisdom of God. And guess what? In order to have wisdom, you got to first have some knowledge. And then God will give you that knowledge and he'll give you life circumstances. And you learn to apply that knowledge in life circumstances. And then guess what? You apply the knowledge, you gain wisdom. And the more you apply wisdom in life circumstances, the more you begin to gain the understanding of God. And through this life cycle, as you learn the word, practice the word, your heart and your mind starts looking more like Jesus and less like the way you Amen. use the thing. What is the wisdom of God? Well, can I just tell you real quick, like, it's the same thing that was the testimony of God. Look, look right here. Let's go backwards a couple of chapters. One chapter, verse 21. After that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that are lost. Isn't that something? It pleased God through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. I was thinking to myself last night. I was in the vehicle. I was thinking, man, I bet you so many people think I'm so heroic. 
You know, like I'm just saying, like what I'm saying is, is that the things that could do when I go off, I, I'm telling you, when I start witnessing the people in Congo, it's a little bit like maybe not, maybe not sweating as much and being as loud because that'd be inappropriate. But what I'm trying to say is I get really, really excited. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't think I'm so fool. And I said, you know what, Lord? Pray, God. Let me be a fool for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let me be counted a fool for Christ instead of the lies of the world. The foolishness of preaching. I, I thought about that before too. Like, Lord, why in the world would you use marred clay? What, what, what does the word marred mean? I'm all y'all jacked up. Why would you use marred clay to speak the eternal word of God? So, and you know, the Lord said, so I'm going to be glory. Amen. So that people don't think they use something. I want to get the glory. They need to know. Yeah, you were on behind that triple quick over there waiting for somebody to come get your head right. And you was a high school dropout. You were nothing but a bum, boy. But I picked you up and I cleaned you up. I put my word in your heart. Now speak out of your mouth. And let them know. They, 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 they may not all show up to church, but guess what? I'll send you. If they ain't coming to you, I'll send you to different places. And I'll use you. Praise God. And that's what I want. Because see, for me... I'm convinced. This is all I want. I'm telling you right now. I don't know on this earth. I, you can see it. I want to be successful. Yes. Because you know what? I want to drive for excellence. But listen, in the end, I'm telling you, I only want one thing to hear those words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Period. Done deal. And if anything else is going to get in the way of that, I don't want it. That's it. Amen? Amen. So look, for the preaching of the cross, it's to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God, but it's also the wisdom of God. It is the testimony of God. Look, the world thinks it's foolish. And God uses the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise. Isn't that, isn't that something? Oh, Lord, help us. We can't. We got to move on. Look, 1 Corinthians 2.10. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. Well, what did He reveal to us? He also says in this letter, He says, for I, He says that, you know, the rulers, we don't get wisdom from the rulers of the world, because if they knew what was going on, they wouldn't have put Jesus on the cross had they known He was the God of the Lord. Right. So we don't get our wisdom from them, but instead we get our wisdom from God. And then he goes on to say this, he says, For eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has planned for those that love the Lord. Dude, that's, that is beautiful, church. Listen to me. You and I both got to get a hold of a concept, and I've been preaching it for a long time, and sometimes I wonder if I'm even so, like, convinced like I need to be. This is a temporary life. This is a dress rehearsal for eternity. This is a moment of time, a blip on the radar. This is a vapor of smoke. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. The Word of God says that there's something after this life. And He's preparing us and He's wanting to know. What do you believe? Eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man. Look, but the Spirit of God, He revealed these things to us through His Spirit. Amen. Now... We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. I want to, real quick, I wanted to say that if you were born, you were born the first time in Adam, born in sin, and you were separated from the life of God. Amen? But then God went all the way through, and he brought Jesus to the world. And then Jesus died on the cross. And then somewhere, somehow, you came into contact, contact with, the, with the wisdom. It's the foolishness of the world, but the wisdom of God. You came into contact with the wisdom of God. And you didn't even know really what to believe. And, but the power of, of a lamb, the power of the blood of a lamb, that doesn't even make any sense. But you believe. And when you did, if you're saved this morning, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not trying to act like you're perfect because the Lord knows I ain't perfect. But if you're saved this morning, you know what I'm talking about. How do you know? Because you got a witness of the Spirit on the inside of your heart. There's been a time in your life that you wasn't the same as what you were before. Now, you might not feel like you feel that Spirit right now, but if you keep on throwing mud or dirt on a living well, sooner or later, you're going to clog it up and you're not going to feel right here the Spirit of the Lord. But it doesn't mean that He left you, church. How he's just one call away. He's one whisper away. And surrender. Hallelujah. To the presence of God. 
spirit of the world. But the spirit moves from God. That's what I'm trying to say. God brought this plan into existence all for a purpose. That he could bring his spirit back to you. Put his spirit in you. So that he can begin to give his wisdom to you. The wisdom of God. So that you can begin to see the breadth and the width and the depth yes. of the mystery of Christ. Amen. He says, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Look, some of the other, the King James says, combining spiritual or comparing spiritual to spiritual. The, the child of God is not trying to make a mix match of the world and the word. <laughs> That's kind of crazy. It's all separated by one letter, right? But we're not trying to take the world and the word and put them together or at least we shouldn't be that's a mixture God's all God's against mixture Amen. have you ever read the book of Leviticus he's against mixture you know and want two seeds in the same field well why would he do that because he don't like mixture he don't like angels cohabiting with women and producing Nephilim he don't like demon spirits he don't like people he don't like mixing the world with the church he don't like mixing truth with lies, he don't like religious leaven inside of his truth. Beware of the leaven of the fair. He don't like mixing the world. Amen. But yet, at the same time, sometimes in our own lives we do that. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. I'm about to close in here a second, but I want you to know something. The natural man. Listen, the man, sometimes whenever you speak truth to, to someone, they're going to think you're foolish because their natural mind, absent of God, can't understand it. But that's not your job anyway. Amen. Right? Amen. You, you remember that, right? What did the Lord say? The Lord said, some plants seed, some water seed, but I'm the Lord of the harvest. I bring the increase. He's just asking you. Sometimes I walk out and I'm like, man, if people really think I'm crazy today. And the Lord's like, you just do what I called you to do, little man. Right. You just be faithful to what I called you to do. Leave the rest up to me, my friend. Leave you watch and see. You may not even see it all on this side. I've shared it to you before, but I'm going to say it again. I, I was one day in, like, in Bayou Pediatrics, probably 16 years ago, 18 years ago. Some dude came in there, and he had just lost his leg. He's like, dude, I just I lost my leg on a, in a Harley accident. And I was so on fire for the Lord. I'm like, look, you know what you need, bro? Because you look, you look like you're down in the dump. You need some Jesus. I'm going to tell you what the Lord did for me. I wrote it down, a little prayer of salvation. Right? It, I ain't seen this dude again. Two years later, this guy comes in. He says, look, I was pass, passing through town. I had my child. And so we were still linked over here. I just had to come in here and tell you something. I had to tell you that. that I got saved, man. I got saved and I went on the church and the Lord changed me. I just wanted to thank you. I had people come back to the office and give this card to Mr. Matt. When you prayed with my boy in the clinic and he was struggling in his mind, the Lord has done a work in his heart. I'm just trying to tell you that. That's only maybe two, maybe three, four times. How many others? Or they're out there that I may never know. I don't need to always see the church full. I don't need, I'd love to see it. But guess what? I don't need, he's the Lord of the heart. Just be faithful to what I called you to do. Amen. Little man. Amen. Quit living here in all the words and the whispers that come from other people. Don't be confounded by the way they look. I called you to preach, preach. Amen. Do what I called you to do. See, the natural man, you can't receive those things. They're spiritually understood. Good news, good news, church, you're not natural. Amen. You're spiritual. Hallelujah. You're born again. Glory you're born again from the dead. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit is in you. Hallelujah. He's giving you wisdom. Yes. Or will you bow to it? Or will you be like the world? No. Are you all, oh, I see. You got yourself some wisdom for your salvation, but now you're going to handle your business like the world. Oh, okay. I see. Mm. And you're going to operate with the natural mind. Oh, you're going to operate according to what well, the law says. And I hired this lawyer. You know, look, that's fine. We got sometimes we got to hire lawyers. I get it. I get it. Okay, but guess what? If the lawyer's telling me to do something that's contrary to the word of the Lord, you you might have to get fired, sir. Because we got to be able to reconcile this situation within this. Because I ain't here. Because ultimately, you ain't the one that's keeping me out of prison. You ain't the one that, that you know, not, not, you're not a, no, no, no. I've got to trust the Lord. 
At some point in time, if I got a venture outside of God's will, then it ain't God's will. Amen. That's good. Help me. That's it. The mind is a terrible thing to waste. Yeah. But look, no, it's not. That's not right. It's not the mind. It's His mind. Jesus is mine. That's what I want to close with. Musicians, singers, don't come up because I always want to close out with time of worship. And if you need prayer this morning, listen, don't be scared of these altars, man. At the altar, the altar is a place of sacrifice. The cross, amen. When we come here, we lay ourselves down and we let the Lord deal with us. I, I try to find these little pictures. Because, amen, there's a whole lot going on inside our brains. Yes. The world and the world's wisdom is vying for our attention and trying to pull us away. From the Lord, right? The way we think and the things that it's trying to do to us. But listen, I want, you, I want you to know. Who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. There's so many scriptures that I can begin to move towards. Ephesians chapter 4 and the renewed mind. Right? Romans chapter 12. Don't be conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. Listen, the word of God, Christian. If you want to go look for a church that focuses more on other stuff, then listen, this is America. you got every right. But I'm telling you right now, if you find yourself in a church that's not focusing on the Word, not teaching you the Word of God, you're, you're going to have, you're going to have be possibly finding yourself venturing astray. It's the Spirit of God through the Word of God giving us the wisdom of God that's going to help us to navigate this journey. Praise God. Let's worship the King. Amen. Thank you.